I'm sure most of you are familiar with um, the Genesis chapter 15, where uh, God comes down to Abraham and says to uh, look up and count the number of the stars of the sky, count the number of the sands of the sea, and then he says, so will be your descendants. We have uh, a number of times uh, looked at those two uh, objects, the sand, the sand of the sea being natural born children, stars of the sky, spiritual descendants, spiritual children, which Paul refers to in his letter to the Romans, that we are children of faith of Abraham. God continues the conversation with uh, Abraham at that point. Abraham says, um, God... <laughs> The heir in my house is not my son. It's a servant. How will I know that this is true? So God tells Abraham to do what uh, he naturally should do. Give an offering. <laughs> then that not that religious? <laughs> Give an offering. <laughs> God tells him to... Uh, <clears throat> Take a heifer, which is a female cow, and a goat, female goat. Interesting, isn't it? A heifer and a she-goat, and then a ram, male ram. I don't know. No, I mean... A she-goat, a she-cow, and a male ram. I was just curious if there's a reason for... Yeah. There is, okay. but I don't know. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, no problem. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, I know that uh, when the uh, tabernacle was dedicated in the wilderness by Moses, that it was a red heifer, red female, red red haired female cow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he kills them, the heifer, the she-goat, and the ram. And then he divides their bodies and splits them one on and makes a trail. Then he takes a turtle dove and a pigeons, and he, he puts them on both sides, but he doesn't divide their bodies. He just puts them on the side. This is very uh, typical of the... Uh, promises that were made between uh, people in the Middle East in those days was to kill an animal and divide it, and then the two individuals that were making uh, a promise with one another would walk between the two an between the divisions of the animal. In this case, we have three animals plus the birds, <clears throat> and God is making a covenant, a promise a contract between himself and Abraham. And he says, this is how you will know that we are, because I'm making this promise with you. And then it says in verses 17 and 18, a fire like a furnace with a smoke blazing went between the animals. You see something missing? Abraham didn't walk between them, only God did. The covenant blessing that was made between God and Abraham doesn't depend on Abraham. It only depends on God. Perry Stone asked a rabbi a number of years ago, what does that mean to Hebrews, to the Jews? And the rabbi told him, he says, what it means is that the, if, if God ever fails in this covenant with the Jew that he will destroy his throne in heaven. The blessing of the Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Covenant, that's the same word. Last will and testament, same word, that God has made those 36 books, 39 books, 39 books of the Old Testament, all depend on God. Don't depend on man. Isn't that interesting? 
What does that mean to you? Well, we get to Matthew chapter 26. Verse 26. Isn't that interesting? 26, 26. Verses 26 through 29. We find Jesus at the Last Supper speaking to his disciples and said as he broke the bread. And then we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul repeats this. He says, in the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and blessed it. He broke it. And he said to the disciples, take, eat all of this, for this is my body broken for you. In like manner, Paul said, he took the cup, which was the fourth cup of the evening that they would pass around. And he says, take ye this cup and drink all of it, for this is my blood shed for you. And this is the cup in Matthew 26, 26. This is the cup of the new covenant, the new testament. God now, in Jesus, sheds his own blood as a covenant blessing and promise and contract with all of us who will believe. Your eternal life doesn't depend on you. It depends on Jesus. Your healings do not depend on you. Your prosperity, your blessings, your good fortune, thank your lucky stars, do not depend on you. They depend on Jesus. His faithfulness, His perfection, His shed blood. His promises to you are written in His own blood and signed by His own hand in blood, not yours. You sit back and you say to yourself, why do I deserve this mess that I'm in? Well, Satan hates you. The world hates you. And there are things that God allows in your life so that you will know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he wants each one of us to learn to trust him, to believe on him, to depend on him, and realize there's nothing that we can add to our salvation, nothing that we can do to appease God to gain healing, nothing that we can attempt to perform that will acquire somehow God's rewards of blessings for us being good. What does he ask of us? Trust. Without faith, which has been translated trust and believe. Not obedience, trust and believe. The obedience comes because of trusting and believing. The performance of your good works are because you have trusted and believed and you're following him. And they are the fruit of your trusting and believing. Good works are a fruit they are an outcropping. I've done this before. You don't walk up to an apple tree and shake it and tell it to bear apples. <laughs> it bears apples because it's an apple tree. You bear good fruit because the Spirit of God is in you. And the fruit is not your fruit. It's God's fruit Amen. of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Being manifested in your life. Love. Joy. Peace. Goodness. What's those fruits? Those nine fruits of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 6. Look them up. They are not things that you have to work at. <clears throat> you don't. <laughs> any of you guys were in, in sports? Do you remember we had to go through weight training exercises? And back in the 60s, one of the things they wanted to try and tell us as we were in football, isometric exercises. I don't know if you remember that name or not. 
they put a rod and a couple of board. Yeah. And you would push against this rod. And that was your exercise. I thought they were cheap. They didn't want to buy weights. You know, how do you know how much you've lifted? I push this bar. Well, so what? You know, they well, how much can you squat? You know, you just sit there and you, I don't know. I was pushing against the bar. Uh, boy, when they got the weight thing, everybody was in there proud. I did 400 pounds in squats, you know, and some guy come along. I did 420. And, and, and he was, oh, aren't you special? And we have transferred that into church. How many souls you've saved? How many prayers you've, you've prayed that gotten answered? Oh, you're a super saint. Hmm. No, you're a saint. Just a saint. You're a saint. You believe God, you trust God. And you may walk around with owies. But that is not the measure of whether you are a Christian or not. (laughs) Growing old ain't for sissies. And you just sit in church and all of a sudden a shooting pain hits you in the foot. And you say, oh, 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 what was all that about? You're just sitting there minding your own business and all of a sudden you start to hurt. Oh, you just God the left foot right here in Jesus' name, heal it. You know, it's just and just let it let it go. <laughs> so I'm glad to see Olivia. We had her name up there on the board, very first person. Olivia Luna in the hospital, and here she sits. Glory to God. <laughs> We're all praying for her. She already here. <laughs> And that's the way God works sometimes, too. He answers the prayer as soon as you think about praying. He's already on the move. So as we lift up our needs today, recognize from Psalm 37 that says, fret not. He says, roll your burden off onto the Lord and he worketh. In the, in the King James is basically and John Martin paraphrase. Give your mess to God and he goes to work. Amen. Amen. Thank you. (laughs) So, you have a need this morning. Share it with us and we'll praise the Lord for the victory that you're going to get. We're going to be looking today at uh, part two on our study of the temples and the east gate. Uh, Temple number three to be built during the tribulation period. Turn in your notes to page two. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, we find Abraham meets the king of Salem. That's Melchizedek. If you remember that story after he won a battle and he goes past the, the city of Salem and, he, and Melchizedek comes down and, and Abraham pays to Melchizedek as a, a thanks for God's blessing. And Melchizedek is called the king of peace, the king of Salem. Salem, the king of Salem, that that city that he was king of, uh, commentators would tell you that it was Jerusalem. That he was the first founder of Jerusalem. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, from Genesis 14 to 2 Samuel 5, we find out that Jerusalem has been conquered. And those that have taken over the city of Jerusalem were the Jebusites. The Jebusites were a people who were always fighting against the Jews. And David now has come to power. Yet in the area that would be the promised land, you have this group of people that are in control of the city that controls the mount, which is Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is the place where it is believed that Abraham offered up Isaac. They have these walls built up around them, and they're almost impregnable. And they have also put the lame and the sick around the outside of the walls so that if anybody came to attack the city, these unscrupulous people would sit back and say, Oh, you harmed the innocent. You harmed those that couldn't fight for themselves. You hurt little women and children, and you bruised and battered these people who are crippled. And, oh, you're an evil person. While at the same time, they'd go around and attack cities all around them and take their goodies and make slaves out of whoever they conquered. Wouldn't talk about that issue today, would we? (laughs) Ever hear of anybody doing stuff like that? Hiding behind the sick and the women and the children in schools? Never heard of such a thing. 
So David, he had he was fed up with this. So he went and found out where they were getting their water from. And he found a tunnel and he found a spring. And he went in through the tunnel, came up right in the middle of the city. Came up through a well, all of him and his soldiers. And they said, Jebusites, guess what? You're done here. And so he conquered that area and it became known as the city of David. And he was in control of it. Egyptian records from 1900 B.C. refer to this city as Yerushalayim. The Assyrians in 1500 B.C. referred to it as Yerushalayim. In Hebrew, it's Yerushalayim, which means possession of peace. Jerusalem is 33 miles east of the Mediterranean. I didn't realize it was that close. 33 miles away is the Mediterranean Sea. It's 14 miles west of the Dead Sea. It's five miles north of Bethlehem. The elevation of Jerusalem is 2,550 feet. The elevation of Mount Olives is not a whole lot higher. It's only a couple hundred feet higher than that. Jerusalem was built first on four hills with some others that surrounded it on other sides. The Temple Mount is the most prominent of all of those hills. And to the south of it, and actually outside the city walls, was Mount Zion. The Temple Mount is Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, where Abraham offered Isaac. The location of the threshing floor of Aruara, which David came to him and bought his threshing floor, and picked that spot, the threshing floor, as the place where the Temple of God would be built. David then gathered all the materials. He came up with the design plans, and God says, you don't get to build it because you're a man of war. But your son, Solomon, will build the temple. In between Mount Olives and the Temple Mount is the Kidron Valley, which we have been talking a little bit about, where there is now a cemetery built up next to the Eastern Gate, which lies between the Temple Mount and Mount Olives in a direct line. Page two of your notes. Those of you who have got new notes, I put numbers on the bottom of the pages. Those of you who have your old notes, uh, on page two it has a picture of the, uh, the temple the, uh, as it sat. A little nice diagram at the top. That's page two. When Moses was in the tabernacle, he built a tent, and this was the place where God would come down to visit, and it was something that they moved around from place to place. Then <laughs> David came along, oh, I need to build you a house, and God looked at him and says, you're going to build me a house? <laughs> are you kidding? What can man build where I wouldn't want to be? You know, the earth is my footstool. What are you talking about, David? <laughs> the first temple, Solomon's temple, built... According to David's specifications, all the plans were prepared, the materials prepared, and there's all the scripture references for you. The splendor and beauty, as had never been seen in Jerusalem, $1980, it was $5 billion bucks in $1980. Now, that one was destroyed. All the gold and silver and everything about it was taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. Ezra's temple... Seventy years later, Ezra and a number of people, only about 125,000 left Babylon and went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Ezra tried to rebuild the temple, but he kept running into roadblocks, mostly because the people got tired and it was hot and they were being persecuted by some of their neighbors. And so for 15 years, they didn't do anything about the temple, but they built houses and made farms and got bank loans to increase their their property and make some money while the temple of God sat vacant. So God came down and says, is it right for you to build your house and not build mine? So Ezra had some problems, and he couldn't do anything because the walls were up, all torn down. So Nehemiah, in his book, chapter 1, he becomes disheartened that the 
city needs to be reconstructed. He eventually gets approval from the, gov- the king to rebuild the walls of the city and the gates, and he does it in 52 days. He builds 10 gates, puts up the walls, and protects the city so Ezra can finish building the temple. That's the second temple, Ezra, on top of page 3. Ezra, in his prediction, said that the Messiah would enter in through this temple. He would come to it. Herod added to the temple. Under Ezra, chapter 3, work stopped for the 15 years through neglect, and it was only completed after Nehemiah had built the, the gates. The third temple is the tribulation temple. Revelation, chapter 11, verse 1. And there was given me a reed like a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, but leave the outer court, for it is given to the Gentiles. Jesus spoke of that temple in Matthew 24, and he said, quoting Daniel 9.27, that it would be the place of an abomination desolation. This is where it would happen in this third temple. Paul explains what the abomination desolation is, and he refers to it, as a tribulation temple in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. He says that the man of sin, who is the Antichrist, will desecrate it. He will desecrate it by entering into it and declaring that he is God. Item number one, the Antichrist shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifices and the offerings. On the wings of abominations he shall be one, who makes desolate, which is a quote from Daniel. So he is desecrating the temple. um, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was once the ruler over the area of Syria after after the fall of Babylon and Assyria, the Greeks came in under Alexander the Great. When he died... The, north, the portion of his kingdom that was north of Jerusalem went through a series of succession of kings and the area that was under the rule of another general in Egypt, these two, the one in the north and the one in the south, were fighting one, one another. And Daniel 11 gives such excruciating detail that it has been looked upon by those who examine the Bible as historic rather than prophetic. Because it starts talking about the intrigue in the palaces of a daughter being married off to some foreign king and the brother getting upset and going down there and fighting and all this stuff's going back and forth. And it's this battle between the king of the north, king of the south, all through chapter 11. And it's referring to those north of Jerusalem, south of Jerusalem, south being Egypt and north being the area of what was Babylon or the Assyrian area. And then he... And it just he, he just abruptly puts on the skids as he's talking about the king of the north, the one who controls basically would be Jordan and, and Afghanistan and a little portion of Turkey and down to northern Iran and Iraq. He's got all this stuff here. He's in control of a vile one shall arise in his estate. Chapter 11 says. And he will not have the desire of women. And he will worship the God of munitions or fortresses or weapons. And he is the Antichrist. You know, that's been in the Bible. (laughs) How many thousand years? And God bless their hearts. These prophecy teachers have been telling us for hundreds of years that the Antichrist comes out of Rome or Europe. No, he don't. (laughs) He comes out of Afghanistan. Daniel told us that. And actually, bless his heart, Daniel wasn't even the one that was saying it. He was taking dictation from the angel Gabriel, who was the one who was talking through chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12. It's all Gabriel who's giving this information. The same guy who came down to Mary and said, Blessed art thou among women. Then Antichrist makes an agreement with the Jews that they can build a temple on the Temple Mount. And that's why I have that picture on page two to show you, friends, the temple itself was not that big. 
This whole room right here could probably have been it. It wasn't very large. It was tall and it was ornate and it was a lot of money pumped into it. But it wasn't that large. What was large was all the area that's referred to as the court of the Gentiles. Because everything outside the temple was the area that this angel was telling John to measure. And he said, don't measure the area that's the court of the Gentiles. Only measure the parts of the temple. And if you could get a translation that turns those reed measurements into feet, you'll find out it's not a very big thing. The Antichrist has to be someone whom all of the nations in the Middle East will respect and obey. One guy that will cause both sides of the Muslim faith Sunnis and Shiites who hate each other and kill each other on a regular basis and cause ISIS to put down their weapons. This guy's got to be somebody that they will respect. And he will take ten nations and make that his empire. And he will make a deal with the Jews. You can build your temple mount up there. There will be peace for seven years. And three and a half years later, he breaks it off. And this is what Jesus is talking about. In Matthew 24, when he says that when you see this abomination desolation, don't even come down off your roof of your house to pack your bag. Jump and run away quickly and pray that your flight will not be in the winter when it's hard and pray that it's not on the Sabbath day when you can't even walk a whole mile. Where do they go? Petra. That's where they go. And as he sends an army to chase after them and kill them, it says God opens up the earth and sends a flood and destroys all of those that are chasing them. And then they go into hiding in the area of Petra. The abominations spoken of by Daniel, standing in the holy place, flee, don't pack, run. Matthew 24, 15. And number three, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 12. The day that the Antichrist makes a covenant with the Jews cannot happen as long as the church is here. He says, because the church restrains, the church hinders. In the King James, it says, let. He that letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And the word let is what is still used in the game of tennis. If you listen to them play at Wimbledon, I don't think they've changed yet. When the ball hits the net and bounces or bounces back or something like that, they call it a let ball, which means the ball has been hindered. And that's where that term comes from in the King James. Remember King James written 1611, about the time of uh, Shakespeare. I don't know why this is funny to me, but... I used to have to argue with people that would be quoting Shakespeare to me and tell me that it was in the Bible. And I could, back in the day when my hair was not gray, <laughs> they figured they knew as much as me. <laughs> now folks, they look at my gray hair and they don't, aren't quite so tended to argue as they used to be. He sets himself up. Now it says, in order for this day to come, the Antichrist is revealed after the rapture. But before the rapture can take place, there has to be a falling away. So, Kathy, call your daughter and tell her, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That word in Greek is the word apostasy. When Christians begin to homogenize their doctrines and lean into apostate teachings, that's the day, the day we are living in. I apologize. Can you repeat that? Sure thing. And I'll emphasize it even more. The Greek word in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that says falling away is the word apostasy. When Christian schools begin to teach evolution of the moon, which is what Kathy's daughter is facing right now. She said God made the moon. Now she's in trouble. In a Catholic school that's supposed to be Christian last I checked. They're the largest single Christian voice in the world is the Catholic Church. But they're not the only ones. Anglicans have become apostate in their doctrine. The Presbyterian Church has become apostate in their doctrines. The Methodists are moving towards apostasy in their doctrines. Apostasy is happening before our eyes, which is a clue 
Look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Hebrews chapter 9. The Lord is coming back for those who are looking for his return. So when you have a brother or a sister says the church is going to go through the tribulation, you look at him and say, have fun. (laughs) You ain't looking for Jesus Christ. You are looking for Antichrist. You will get him. (laughs) But fear God in those folks. Now, whether they go up or not is not my decision. I just like to put it back in their face. You can give me all of their stuff. I give them a little stuff of my own. When will the third temple be built? Look at these dates on the stuff that I have written here. Nothing in Scripture says when. But it has already been developed. June 1967, Washington Post, before the Six-Day War, to persons of Jewish faith all over the world to... A project to rebuild the temple of God in Israel is now being started. With divine guidance and help, the temple will be completed and will signal a new era in, Ju- in Judaism. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, I mentioned this before when we were talking about feast days. The Jews have never been able to keep the, the feast days like they're supposed to since the loss of their nation back in 70 A.D. Everything they've been doing ever since, they haven't been doing it right. And they still aren't today. 1985, National Geographic, a new age steers as Israelis return to the strength of their Jewish past. They dream of the ancient kingdom in in Jerusalem. Some of the priests of the, I can't say the word, study the archaic laws of animal sacrifice in preparation for building of the temple. Rabbi Shalom Chaim, I can't say the rest, in Jerusalem, we would never forget the supreme purpose of the returning Jew to Israel is to build a temple. 1987 at the Jewish College. Several students were going through a 16-year process of becoming temple priests, which included lessons in animal sacrifices. This was 87. Those 16 years are done. A group of Jews called the Temple Mount Faithful try every year to set a temple cornerstone at the Temple Mount. What's stopping the construction? There needs to be a peacemaker. It is needed to create a peace treaty so that the Dome of the Rock and the Temple of the Jews can coexist on the same mountain at the same time. I wrote that before the word coexist got to be a bumper sticker the peacemaker will likely be the antichrist and the peace treaty will be the covenant of one week seven years that daniel speaks of second thessalonians says the antichrist will not appear till the church the restrainer is removed therefore the third jewish temple will not be built until after the rapture and in the middle of the tribulation period it will be desecrated and that's when the jews need to run for cover where will the third temple be built mount moriah the chosen of jehovah Traditions based largely on Josephus say that the Mount Moriah, 2 Chronicles 3, 2 Samuel 24, is identical with the mountain of the land of Moriah, Genesis. God appeared to David at the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Number two, Solomon's temple was built. Number three, Abraham was about to offer a sacrifice of Isaac. The Muslim Dome of the Rock is now the most prominent structure on the Temple Mount. Muslims deny that Solomon's temple was ever here or that David came here. Riots and protests have taken place over the last several years as Muslims try to remove evidence of previous Jewish presence. And the Jews have started their own archaeological excavations to prove their evidence is is there and still there. And stuff comes up occasionally. I find it really interesting, personally, having studied this stuff for several years that there are these amazing discoveries in archaeology that come up and prove a lot of things and show a lot of evidence of scriptural, factual statements and the proof that the Jews were there, at the same time that there are things in the news that capture everybody else's attention. It seems like the devil wants to play smoke and mirrors with us and divert our attention like a magician does to something else so that we don't see what God's doing over here. And he's proving, almost on a weekly basis, the truth of the history of the Jews in this land. It's their home. And stuff comes up that just floors me. And people are still arguing about it. I I remember, uh, I think it was in the 90s, there was a a tunnel that was being dug by some archaeologists. And they almost took that thing to the Supreme Court to have that thing sealed up. And what they were, because they were discovering evidence of the Jewish Temple Mount being there with artifacts and inscriptions and stuff on stones that it was absolutely denying everything that was being said in the press. Uh, on the outside of the Dome of the Rock, in Arabic, are um, 
is a phrase that God has no son. There's another phrase that says, stop saying Trinity, you people of the book. The people of the book are Christians. And it says it will be stern for you if you don't. Really? I have a message for you too. From the book. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in you. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. You know that that's the, the devil comes. He's a thief. He's a liar. He has come to kill and destroy. Amen. That's the game. That's the game. When you hear all that stuff about how you have to earn God's forgiveness, when you blow it. Hey, let me tell you sometimes. You're not just a sinner because you sin once in a while. You sin once in a while because you want to. You don't want to do what God tells you to do. I, I'm going to put my hand up first. I want to do what I want to do. I deserve a break today. Bless me. God, I've had all this pressure all this week, and I've had all these reports, and I'm just fed up, and I don't want to have to think about church stuff. I'm going to think about Lord of the Rings or Indiana Jones or some other thing. Some shoot him up with John Wayne. Ah, now you're talking. You know. ah. Yeah, there you go. Hot dog. And God's all the time saying, John, you need to look at your Sunday school lesson. And I'm getting all fixed up. And guess who chimes up? The little woman back there in the back. John, have you looked at your Sunday school lesson today? I've been fighting the Jesus all day not to look at it because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. <coughs> Mumble, mumble, grumble, grumble. What does it say here? Dome of the Rock. Anybody remember Roger Miller? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember? Yeah. Yeah, he had some really neat songs. Really, really neat. The one, that, the one that captured almost everybody's attention, and it wasn't a fun song, but it was uh, a message. It's my belief pride is the chief cause in the decline in the number of husbands and wives. I, 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 I get, okay, you know, God talks to me. He pricks my conscience. Why I get upset sometimes? Pride. And almost invariably every time, it's pride. And, I, and I'm sorry to get off on this, but I think of all of the stuff with the people that are running red lights. There's a ton of it. And all of the craziness and the way that people are driving, it seems like it gets worse around Christmas time. It's pride. The root of it is pride. Me first itis is pride. You like that? Me first itis. <laughs> I got a ticket one time for driving too fast. I was doing 72 and a 55. And the guy pulled me over, gave me a ticket. And so naturally I took, <laughs> I took the educational thing. You know, you're supposed to go to school and learn to be a good boy. You know, so I'm taking I ran across this short sentence, like about page 40 out of 100 pages, that said 95% of the laws, traffic laws, in the state of California are based off of patience and courtesy. 95% of the laws in the state of California could disappear overnight if people were patient and courteous. Can you imagine? That is a huge number. Swallow our pride. One preacher said, we're not only sinners by nature, we're sinners by choice. And we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. And that's why Romans chapter 7, who shall deliver me from the body of this death that is dragging me down? Oh, it's time to quit. Page 5, we will return. The one that has the little, the little small, the small gazebo, we'll pick up there next week. <clears throat> Paul said from chapter 1 of the book of Romans to chapter 7 he is basically talking about us and being good trusting God believing in God doing what we're supposed to do be nice a lot of the things that you would kind of expect you need to be patient you need to be kind you need to be courteous you need to be forgiving you need, and then you know you, you find some Sometimes sermons are preached for three weeks just telling you how you're supposed to act that mom should have taught you when you were a kid. You should have been doing this stuff in second nature, but we still have to be taught today. 
Then all of a sudden, Paul spins on a dime in chapter 8, and he starts talking about the Holy Spirit. And all through chapter 8, until he gets to the end of the book, this is how you act to act. This is things you should be doing back here. But let me tell you how you get it done. Get hooked up with the Holy Spirit. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Seek the wisdom and control and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Let Him whisper to you what you ought to do and follow Him. Because He will not leave you, abandon you, forsake you. He's in you and will give you what you need to know and fill you with the mind of Christ so that you can act and live right and have peace with God. The Holy Spirit is the secret to our success as Christians. Jesus promised that he would come. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is that unnamed force because he doesn't want attention drawn to himself. He wants attention drawn to Jesus Christ. And if you don't have the 